People have to be very careful of seeing more in a design than what there is. Oh, what secret message can I put in my note? If there's any hidden meaning in there, it was with ever who came up with the great seal. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, November 1st at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, November 1st, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to our channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified on new updates, and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. We really do appreciate your support. Franklin No is our guest today. Franklin is the president of No Historical Consulting. Franklin is a historical consultant and has advised the U.S. Treasury, Federal Reserve, and international financial agencies on monetary and sovereign debt policy issues, including currency legislation, production, evolution, and design. And we're delighted to have Franklin here with us as a first-time guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Franklin, though. Franklin, welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How's things over where you are? Doing great. Things here are pretty good. good. Um, every day is a, a good day. Best day ever. We try to keep it that <laughs> way. <laughs> try to keep it that way. Um, Franklin, you know, we've we've talked a lot about currencies and money printing on this channel, but we've not yet discussed the history and design of banknotes. And I'm really excited to tap into your wealth of knowledge in this area, as well as the future of currencies. But first, Let's start by having you share with us what you do and how you got into this industry. Um, pretty much, I am a consultant. I advise um, basically on historical issues. I work a lot with the U.S. Department of Treasury, with the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing, where banknotes are printed, designed and printed. And I've been working with them for around 20 years. Uh, I do historical research. I write policy papers. I answer questions from the public. Um, I show up on TV or radio and help with external relations a lot. Um, I got into it almost by chance. Um, my doctorate is actually in British history. It had nothing to do with finance or anything like that, though my bachelor's degree was in business and economics, but uh, the Bureau was looking for somebody who could make sense of treasury securities, and uh, they have probably about 50,000 in their vault and from 1860 onward, and I was chosen to give it a try, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, I've just expanded to uh, history of the public debt, history of Civil War finance, uh, history of money and all the various uh, avenues because uh, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing prints currency and has for over 150 years. So that's wow. how I got there. Wow, it's pretty interesting. Um, in what areas have you advised the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve? I mean, uh, what specific knowledge did they require from you? As far as currency goes, what has the Treasury done in the past? What, how have bank notes looked in the past? Are there legal impediments to doing something? Um, and those are the general ideas. Uh, some, some on banknote design. Um, usually, um, I'd like to say I help with uh, historical content. Say, so if you're thinking of redesigning a piece of currency, what images or people from the past would look good here? How would it fit in with a story? Um, because a banknote design is basically built around a narrative. If you look at a note from any country, there's a story being told there. And what are the pieces that will tell that story that will look good, fit in the composition? Um, and the banknote designers have a whole balls juggling in the air at the same time, and you're trying to help them fit pieces together. Um, so that's what I, I kind of do on banknotes besides um, 
history of issuances, how much is issued, what kind of presses they were run on, what kind of paper they were printed on, things like that. I'll tie in a, a question to, to what you just talked about a bit later on. Um, but currencies and money, are they one and the same to you? I would say not. Uh, money is a very is the most generic term. Uh, a currency is something that is actually, I would say, passed hand to hand. That would be my definition. I'm sure people will disagree or have other definitions. But for me, a currency would be a, a, a coin or a note. Um, and money would be like M0, M1, M2, these big categories that economists use of what the money supply consists of. That's, that's the differentiation I would make. U.S. banknotes, given that you're a historian of money, what led to the creation of banknotes and how well received were they when they were first introduced? Well, I'm going to talk about uh, banknotes put out by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And since banknotes have been around for a very, very long time in Europe and they moved over to America, but it, uh, the U.S. government didn't print its own notes until 1861. Um, and those were demand notes, which had a small issue. This is at the start of the U.S. Civil War. And the government's trying to figure out ways to finance the war. Uh, the big change that occurs is in 1862 when the Legal Tender Act is passed. And that's when the first fiat currency is printed in the United States. And these are United States notes, which come to be known as greenbacks. Um, and when they were re released, they were a real sensation. Um, there were songs written about them. There was like the greenback march. Um, it showed up in cartoons and newspaper articles because um, it was a really new thing to have this currency that maintained its value or had the same value wherever you were in the United States. Um, and before that, there were only private currencies and all these changed in value according to where you were, what bank was issuing them, et cetera, et cetera. So it created quite a splash and it, it kind of still resonates today. Everybody knows what a greenback is. Yeah, that was gonna be my, my next question where the greenback, is that the origin of the U.S. dollar note that we, we have today? Uh, pretty much. Um, the first notes were designed by the American Banknote Company in New York City at the time because the Treasury did not have its own printing facility or designers or anything like that. It, it just wasn't part of their uh, writ. Um, and what was going on at the time I'll, I'll tell you about the derivation of the name greenback. Um, the green the, uh, notes today and notes in the 1860s had green backs because green ink was put it was put on the face. Now here's this here's the story. Um, back in the 1840s, 1850s, uh, printers were looking for a way or an ink that could not be removed from a note. Because if you were a counterfeiter, what you, one of the things you wanna do, one way to do it is to get a bank note, wipe off the ink on it and reprint it. So you have this, you know, uh, the bank note paper, but you have this brand new image on it. So if you could find a way or an ink that you could apply that no counterfeiter could get off without destroying the note, that was a good thing. And the chemist came up with this ink, with this, uh, which had a, a copper base to it. And it, it was known as a non-removable ink and it became known as patent green ink. But it was green because that was the formula because of the chemical composition. Nobody picked green, it just happened that way. And so with this patent green ink, which was expensive, you only put it on the face. The problem was it bled through to the back. So you had to print something on the back to cover it up. And so you print green all over the back to cover up the ink on the front. And so these, these notes were brand new and they were used a lot in paying the troops during the Civil War. 
And soldiers being soldiers, when they got all these things, said, hey, look, it has a green back. Let's just call them greenbacks from now on. Because other notes had been brown or red or something like that, but these were brand new. They came from the government payroll officer and, and the troops named it the greenback. And the name has stuck ever since. And it's also basically become the basic design component of every note after that. If you look at any other uh, U.S. banknote since then, there's going to be green on the back somewhere. It's an interesting story there. I had, <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. I, mean, I can't imagine there, there's a couple of guys sitting down, maybe having a, a cup of coffee out by their tent and looking at the money and saying, hey, look at this, this green back. Little did that guy know it was a, he coined, <laughs> he coined the phrase. But um, what was the, uh, and, the highest? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, and just these early notes. I mean, the back was completely green, it, much more than today. They were vibrant green, so yeah. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, what was the um, highest denomination U.S. banknote ever circulated, and why do we not have denominations higher than $100 today? Um, the highest note that circulated on a regular basis was $10,000, and... I think the first ones printed in the 1870s, not long after the Civil War. Um, and the Treasury stopped printing them in 1945, and the Federal Reserve stopped issuing or reissuing the notes in 1969. Um, the decision was made in 1969. Uh, for a number of reasons. What you'll get in the Federal Reserve document is uh, there's no need for these high denomination notes because only criminals and tax evaders use them anyway. Um, but there was no proof of this. It was just anecdotal that, you know, if it's a high denomination note, the criminal's using it. And the argument from the Fed was Nobody needs a denomination this big in the modern age in 1969 because everybody has checks now. And there are these credit cards starting to appear. And you know, by 1975, no one will use cash anymore. So there's no reason to have these high denominations anymore. And the trigger that started everything in 1969 was the, the number of notes in the Federal Reserve vaults was getting very low. So they would have to do a reorder. They'd have to send an order to the BEP saying, start printing more of these notes. And, but the plates were so old, they'd have to make new plates. So that was an expense. So the Federal Reserve is thinking of, a, of an excuse why we don't have to print these and pay the money to have new plates, have a new print run, uh, store them and set up all the systems to process them. So the good, the easy excuse is just to say, well, criminals use them, and so might as well get rid of them. And it's kind of an argument you hear even today with Kenneth uh, uh, Rogoff wants to get rid of the hundred because only criminals use the hundred, you know. And the uh, same thing with the five hundred euro note. Yeah, uh, stop printing those because only criminals use them. Um, and. There was another part of your question which I didn't get to. What was it? Um, it was I, I think you got it. The um well, okay. the highest denomination magno, you answered that ten thousand and then um mm -hmm. why we don't have uh denominations higher than a hundred dollars today. So yeah, you you picked it up, you picked yeah. up both. Yeah. Um it's in sixty nine, uh the five hundred, the thousand, the five thousand, and ten thousand were ended. That was the part I wanted to add on. Okay, I saw a, a short clip of you on on YouTube looking at a one hundred thousand uh, dollar gold certificate. When okay. when you saw I that, that. Yeah, when you saw that, what was what goes on through your mind when you see these high denomination gold certificates? Uh, for anyone who works inside the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, such a thing is just a product. It's just a piece of paper. And you're looking at it and how it was produced. If someone in the Bureau, Bureau looks at any banknote, they'll start thinking, okay, how did they make this? Because um, you don't really get caught up in the value of things. Uh, within the department of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing that I worked in, there were uh, notes 
uh, treasury notes worth half a billion uh, printed on the face. So, uh, you know, at times I could hold, you know, two billions worth of uh, securities in my hand and it's just a product. It, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, what I'm going to say is these things have value until the Federal Reserve issue. Up until then, it's just a piece of paper with ink. Um, but for a hundred thousand dollar note, it's you know uh, it's the gold standard. Roosevelt going off the or making holding gold illegal. Um, these things, the series 1934, which were the hundred thousand dollar notes, um, are only being circulated between the Fed and the Treasury because they're still moving gold around, and this is a handy way to do it. You know, using a Wilson portrait, the idea of a Wilson portrait has been, was bouncing around since the 1920s. Um, so you, for, for me or for somebody else in the Bureau, you're looking at all these bits and pieces that are going together to create this note. And it's an interesting historical exercise, at least for me. Yeah, so it's still, I guess, in a sense, being used in some small way then. Uh, they're really not used anymore. They were, all the notes were retired. Um, you'll see some in uh, displays in different uh, Federal Reserve note, uh, Federal Reserve banks or in the Treasury or at the Smithsonian. You'll, and I think, and there are a few sheets flying around that were printed by the BEP just for display purposes. Um, these days, um, I'm trying to remember, they, well, they don't really move gold around anymore, but in the 30s or in the 40s, if, it, if one of the Fed banks or the Treasury wanted to move um, gold around, they just basically typed out a letter or a memo that said, okay, move this over here and move that over there. It's very administrative and bureaucratic. So it's not, you know, anything fun to look at anymore. <laughs> where are the Federal Reserve notes printed today? And where does the instruction to fire up the printing press come from? And how quickly can these, uh, can the currency be printed and distributed into the economy? Okay. Uh, the way the system usually works, the Federal Reserve Board has a bunch of uh, economists and other people who try to forecast uh, cash need for the next year. And at some point late in a year, we'll issue a print order to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, how many of each denomination they are expected to print the next year. Um, and I'm sure during the year, uh, other orders can come out to you know, switch production to a certain note over another note, uh, if there's a gap, the BEP will try and fill it. Um, so there, there are currency orders, an annual order and individual orders during the year. Um, it takes probably about, from start to finish, a week to print a note. And that's mostly a lot of waiting time uh, because the presses will run 10,000 sheets an hour. So you're really printing these things really fast. But the problem is you have to link the, let the ink cure between each printing. So you have to let them sit for three days. And then you run it through the press again. You'll do the back first and you do the face. Um, so that's six days of just letting stuff sit. Then you'll run it through other machines to put the seals and the numbers on. So that might take a day, but those inks don't need to really cure for long. So it'll be about a week from when you start to when you finish. Um, when they get issued, that's really up to the Federal Reserve. Um, once the Bureau of Engraving and Printing prints their notes, they put it in the Federal Reserve vault, which is on site, either in uh, Fort Worth or in Washington, DC. And then they just sit there until they're called. And then they'll be shipped to a regional Federal Reserve Bank or cash processing center. And from there, they'll go to an individual bank that has ordered them, and they'll sit in that bank's vaults for who knows how long before they get actually issued. So you really can't say. 
it might be a month, it might be two months, something like that, from start to actually in somebody's hand. Okay. Um, what percentage of the money supply are actually Federal Reserve notes compared to uh, digital um, digital inputs, keystrokes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or basically accounts, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had to look this up because I don't keep this in the back of my head all the time. Um, it looks like the money supply overall, when you're talking about savings accounts, checking accounts, all that is about 18 trillion uh, for the US and 2 trillion of that is currency. Uh, and that would be coin and notes. So it's about 11% is, uh, and probably 10% of overall is probably banknotes. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe you can disclose this, maybe you can't, but <laughs> what are some some secrets in the design of the Federal Reserve notes that uh, most people are are likely to be unaware of. Hmm. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of it are you'll see if you look at it closely, because there's a lot of security features that are so that a user can look at them. Um, if you'll you, if you look at different bills these days, you'll see. Um, OVD ink, ink that changes color as you move it. You'll see this like on the 20 and on the 100, um, it changes color. Uh, on the 100, you'll have a ribbon which has holograms on it. Um, a lot of notes have something that you probably won't see unless you get out your magnifying glass. They have micro printing on them. Uh, often it's around the oval of the portrait. You'll mm -hmm. see there's very small, small printing in there. Um, and you'll need a magnifying glass to see it. Um, it's surprising that the presses can print something that small, but they can. Um, you'll find, I'm just pulling things out of my head. If you're looking at most, most notes, the portrait has a three quarter view. The person's not looking directly at you or at, in profile. Um, and I've looked for, a good reason why this is. Um, engravers that I've talked to say the three quarter view is the best because it's the hardest to copy. It's the hardest view for them to engrave and hardest for them to copy. Um, around the borders of almost every note, you'll see this intricate work or all these lines that crisscross. Uh, that's called guillotine or lathe work. And it used to be very big in the 19th century. There was a special machine that was built that only banknote printers had that would kind of like a spirograph. If anybody's old enough to remember what a spirograph is, uh, it kind of worked like that and created all these fine lines because it was almost impossible for another engraver to do. Even if you had the machine, you couldn't redo it. Um, what else? Um, design. Um, on the $1 bill, uh, if you look on the back, you'll see the two sides of the Great Seal. Um, a lot of uh, previous commentators have talked about all the symbology in it and that. The interesting thing is um, the back of the $1 bill, as we see it now, was designed by President Franklin Roosevelt. He was a big stamp collector, and he was always putting his fingers into uh, stamps that were being made at at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing while he was in office. I thought that was a lot of fun. And during his time, I think in 1935, the one, the back of the one had to be redesigned because a new series of silver certificates was coming out. And that's when they put the great seal on. And when they first put it on, the two circles were switched. And Roosevelt didn't like this because on the left would be the eagle with its beak facing off the note. And he thought this was a terrible design idea. So he had him switch it so that now the eagle is on the right side and its beak is facing towards the center of the note. And if you look at the eagle, uh, the eagle is grasping in one claw arrows and then the other olive branch and the beak is facing the olive branch uh, because 
the idea is the US is prepared to defend itself, but it prefers peace. Um, and I'm not sure how much further I can go with all these little things, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of end it there with the popular $1 bill. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, spiral graphs were pretty cool once that uh, big <laughs> multicolor pen came out. Everybody, oh, yeah. red, green, yeah. blue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I got to ask you this. Otherwise, uh, the guys are gonna they're gonna skewer me if I don't. Uh huh. Um, the the currencies, the bills, the notes, they represent a, a country's uh, history, things like that. So, how did a pyramid get on the U.S. one dollar bill? <laughs> Um, well, it's on the Great Seal, and so you'd have to talk to somebody at the State Department about why the, why it's on the Great Seal to begin with. Um, and I don't know why the designers at the time thought putting the Great Seal on the back of the one was a, a great idea. Um, people have to be very careful of seeing more in a design than what there is. Uh, if you're in that process, what you're doing, a designer will come up or a group of designers will come up with about 15 different ideas and they'll start throwing them against the wall and see, and see what sticks. Um, you know, how does this, these, so you're choosing the great seal to put on the back of the one. Um, how is this gonna run on a press? How tough is it to engrave? How tough is it for somebody to counterfeit that engraving? Um, how, how does it fit in a composition? It creates a very symmetrical composition on the back of the note because you have one thing on either side. You don't have something asymmetrical. So it looks good. And you can put something in the middle and it'll fit within the uh, accepted frame that's there. And these are the things that the designers are thinking about. They're not thinking about, oh, what secret message can I put in my note? Um, and that's just not happening. That's, that's not how the process works. And once you get that design, it has to go through various levels of permission. Everybody has to sign off on it, usually, and up to the Secretary of the Treasury. And in some cases, the President wants to sign off on it because he thinks it looks cool. Um, so, yeah, if there's any hidden meaning in there, it was with ever who came up with the Great Seal. And I forget who that is. If it was Ben Franklin or somebody else on that committee coming up with the Great Seal during the Revolutionary War. Sorry, okay. I, I can't come up with a better answer than that. No, it's... um. I'm, I'm at peace. I'm at peace. No, no, <laughs> nobody's trying to put little <laughs> secret hidden things in, 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 in the notes. Um, so yeah. 1935 was the first time they used the, the great seal on that silver. From what I remember, yes, yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting history there. Um, future of money. How long more do you think we will still use the current Federal Reserve dollar bills? Do you expect physical cash to be phased out soon? And I think you mentioned back in um, 75, they... They were already thinking that. Yeah, uh, in the late 60s, the idea started to first fly around that, you know, cash was on its way out. And we've been hearing that for the past, you know, 40, 50 years. Uh, and day now, cash is going to disappear. And I, I usually I tell people expect cash to be around for another generation. Um, I cannot see it being phased out before 30 years. Um, there's, there's one, people are just used to it. Um, even if you force a habit, uh, it's a way that people do payments. They know how to handle cash. They know how to keep it safe. They know how to use it. It gives them anonymity. It can be a store of value. Um, and when, you know, when the internet's down, you can still use it. You don't need an electronic network to use it. Um, there's a vast industry that deals with handling cash from printing it to moving it to safekeeping it to processing it. There's a whole lot of inertia 
even if you wanted to change it tomorrow, that is involved that would stop uh, a quick uh, replacement of cash. So for, for me, you know, if you're a security printer working on banknotes, you've got a job till you retire. Okay. Yeah, and that's, um, that's something that's always on our mind as well, because we keep hearing about uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, mm -hmm. different uh, central banks, they, they're testing it, or they're thinking of it, they're developing mm -hmm. it. And so we hear that these are going to come in, and then eventually cash is going to be phased out. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious as to your opinion on the CBDCs. And um, yeah, what, what do you think about them? I think uh, CBDCs are, you know, a pretty great idea. Uh, they give uh, a central bank a lot of options and a lot of options they're looking for. Um, and there's different models flying around uh, creating kind of creating a CBDC that is wholesale that will only go to uh, banks and other uh, service providers or a retail idea where everybody has in their individual account. Um, you know, there's real pluses to this. Uh, uh, it got put into some proposed legislation here in the US because, you know, if everybody has their own account with the Fed, it's easy to move stimulus money to them electronically. You don't have to write checks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you have electronic money, you can play with the um, interest rates more easily. You can do remote payments faster and easier. Uh, so there's a lot of upsides to it. But the problem is, one, cash is going to be around because there's so much structural inertia in place. Plus, cash plays a real good role. And a lot of these uh, CBDC models still say, oh, by the way, we will still have cash at the same time that we have this. Yeah. Um, so... So, so my little cause is what I call smart banknotes, which are basically traditional banknotes that can talk to an electronic network. Um, say it has a chip in it or something like that. And when you're offline, it acts just like cash. It looks just like cash, no problems. But if you want to move money, say do a remote payment, you don't have to put it in the mail or do anything like that. You go to um, either on your phone or something like that, move the amount on that note to an electronic account and ship it off or manipulate it however you want. Um, and so for me, it, it, the idea gives a central bank all the benefits of having an electronic or form of money, but people who don't want that, still use a banknote in the same way they always have. Keep it safe the same way you always have. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not using a cryptocurrency where you need a special wallet that's on your phone and has all these protections to it and entering private keys and public keys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for me, smart banknotes just makes sense for, for everybody. Um, it, it'll certainly keep the security printer still going for a good long time. So for me, that that's, that's my current cause. I'll, we'll see how much traction it gets. Okay. Um, just a side question though. What, what do you say to people who feel that um, CBDCs and all of these things and the eventual phasing out of, of cash at some point, well, what do you say to them when, uh, when they say things like, um, this is going to limit freedoms and things like that. I think that's a very valid concern. Um, there are some ideas floating around about C C CBDCs that take this into account and say, we won't, we won't track the money or there won't be a ne necessity to track the money below a certain transaction level much like there is today in the US, if you move $10,000 or more, that has to be recorded somewhere. And I couldn't see why a central bank couldn't set up a system saying, you're transacting less than 100 or $500, mm -hmm. 
nobody has to know where that's going. They don't have to track that. And, you know, maybe you might tie it to a denomination. Um, I'm not quite sure how that would work in practicality, um, but central banks are thinking about this. Um, and there, there has to be a way to do it without impinging on, on privacy. But it's a, it's a really valid concern. Um, and maybe with smart banknotes, there may be a way to um, cut that off or make the notes more anonymous. Uh, that you only have to transfer the value, you don't have to transfer any other information back and forth once it connects to an electronic network. Um, it, yeah, it's a valid concern and I, I think it needs to be really looked at and not glossed over while all the regulators are very concerned with anti-money laundering and things like that. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, honest answer there. Um, are legal tender laws still necessary in the future when we, let's say, when we move forward to these smart bank notes and digital currencies? It depends what you want to do. Because um, legal tender really only says basically that the government issuing this currency is standing behind it in some way. Uh, because current tender, legal tender laws doesn't mean you can walk into any store and use a 20 to buy something. That's not how it works. It just says that it is a legal way to settle a debt. A store doesn't have to accept it or in a private transaction, you don't have to accept it, but the government must accept it as a payment for a debt owed the government. Um, that gives a note or a currency, uh, there's far more confidence in such a currency. You know, if you're having Libra, Libra gets rolled out, the new uh, stablecoin currency. Um, it's not a legal tender, but it could be backed by, say, a basket of dollars, which are legal tender, or euros, which are legal tender, which gives a great deal more stability and uh, authenticity to a, a stable coin like that. Um, certainly in the US, up until maybe the Second World War, not all US government currency was a legal tender. Uh, some notes were not a legal tender. Um, that had to do with certain laws within the government about how the notes could be used as backing. But certainly before the Civil War, all the currency circulating in the US did not have legal tender status. Um, so it's not necessary for an economy to function or for a currency to be valid, but it does give a big uh, uh, jump up to whatever currency, currency has that. Okay, uh, one more thing on these. Um smart bank notes, are there any mm -hmm. countries that are ready to issue these smart bank notes and move forward with it? Uh, the Marshall Islands is coming out with something that they call a smart note. Uh, it, I think it's gonna be released next year. It's for their cryptocurrency called the Sovereign. Um, the model that I've seen so far for what they call a smart bank note, it looks more like a debit card. It's that structure, it has a chip in it. Um, I would not call that a smart bank note because it looks like a credit card to me and people will handle it differently than you would a paper or a polymer bank note, which looks just like that and feels like that. So they're the only ones that I know of there are, I, I was looking at some of the CBDC proposals and uh, in a line or two, they will mention something that looks like a smart bank note, something that can act as a traditional note, but will connect in some way. Uh, so the idea is floating around out there. Uh, again, I don't think it has much traction or 
has gotten much traction because all of the discussions have been at such a high level um, that people really haven't thought about uh, applying such things. Even in China, where they're starting to roll things out, they're not using nodes. They're just using purely electronic uh, devices. The software will run alongside the US dollar as a currency. Um, yeah. Well, that's interesting and, that, that Marshall Islands would go ahead and um, sort of spearhead this. Well, it helps that there's only 60,000 people. Uh, so it's a small thing to, to deal with. It's, it's not dealing with billions of uh, notes or something like that. Uh, you know, if you can get away with printing, you know, 40,000 cards, uh, that's not a major uh, effort. Um, but you'll, as you can see also with the Caribbean, the smaller countries are able to move much faster than say the US or the ECB or China. Okay. Um, Dr. No, what's your view about currencies not having intrinsic value on their own and that they will always need a tangible monetary asset like gold to back them? Um, well, for me, basically, um, anything is valued relative, relatively. Um, a community basically defines what something is worth. As you know, the value of gold fluctuates and has fluctuated a great deal over the past couple of centuries. Um, to argue that gold has some kind of uh, deep intrinsic value maybe doesn't work for me because the definition is, is different. You know, you could say, a sandwich has an intrinsic value because it has so many calories in it. And if you eat it, you know, you get so many calories out of it. Uh, an ounce of gold in one place can be worth more than somewhere else. Or if it's being used for an industrial process, you know, it does become worth more. Um, so I have a problem in that, with that. Plus, uh, the U.S. has been off the gold standard since the 70s. Um, and... The dollar, you know, has inflated over time. And it certainly has, but would connecting it to the gold standard still have, have stopped that? I don't know. Um, so, in in my opinion, you do not need this um, particular asset to anchor the value of something. Um, it's more, in for me the strength of an economy is a better anchor for the value of something. Okay. So it's nice to have uh, some metallic standard or certainly if you put gold or silver in a basket along with other things to you know, stabilize a value, I think that makes perfect sense. It's another brick that helps hold things together, but a direct one-to-one -one doesn't, historically it hasn't worked out very Bitcoin, do you consider uh, Bitcoin a viable form of currency? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, let's run through what a currency is supposed to do. Uh, it's a, supposed to be a store of value, a unit of account, and uh, a payment method. Okay, so is Bitcoin a good store of value? The problem with Bitcoin for all these is that it's too volatile yet. If it was much more stable in value, I think it would hit all the pegs. But do you want to store a lot of your income in Bitcoin when you're not quite sure where the price is going? And I'm not talking about being an investor. That's something else. But you're a mom and pop, you got an extra thousand dollars. Are you going to? put, you know, 10 hundreds in the drawer, or are you going to buy Bitcoin? Um, probably you're going to get the hundreds or maybe, you know, buy a fraction of silver or gold where the price is far more stable over time. So I think Bitcoin is a really cool investment, but do you want to use it as a currency, as a store of value? I'm not sure about that. Um, okay, as a unit of account, again, 
use, using the dollar, you can price out something in dollars. You know, this house is worth $50,000, okay? Okay, how many Bitcoin is that house worth? Well, it depends what day you're talking about. Um, that maybe it's worth three Bitcoin, maybe it's worth, you know, 20, you don't know. So again, it, it doesn't work that well. As a payment, um, this is what crypto has been wrestling with for since 2008, basically. Uh, it is a good, it is a payment method, but one, the price is volatile. Two, you have to deal with the blockchain and there's a whole lot of other things out there that move a lot faster uh, than the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, you know, waiting 10 minutes for your transaction to go through versus, you know, Ripple or uh, the Visa network or a piece of cash, which is instantaneous. Um, so I am certainly not down on Bitcoin, don't get me wrong, but right now it doesn't work very well as a currency. Um, so that, that's my position on that. Um, I do own Bitcoin, by the way, so okay. I, 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 am a, I am a fan, but not as a currency right now. Okay, so all the all the Bitcoin people calm down. All the gold people <laughs> calm calm down. Everything's everything's good here. Um, last question. Things will get better. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In your years of consulting with the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve, were there discussions or considerations about gold in the context of a monetary asset? In my in my time there. No, they're, they're, they're way beyond that. Um, uh, once, I think once 1973 passed, that was it. Um, and we moved on to the, to the uh, currency transaction networks, to Forex, et cetera. It's what the dollar is worth on the open market. Um, what yeah, everything that I remember happening was before my time, you know, putting, uh, moving Euro dollars around, uh, selling bonds to the French or the English to prop up the dollar on the exchanges. Um, that just doesn't happen anymore. It, it floats purely freely. And I, I have seen no talk about gold in any way. Dr. Noel, before we wrap up, can you share with us more about Noel Historical Consulting? Um, well, I talked a lot about it so far. Um, like I said, um, I'm based here just outside Washington, D.C. Um, I work a lot for the Treasury and other financial institutions. I'm talking to uh, crypto people now these days. Um, so. Um, I'm, I'm always willing to help out. Uh, if people have questions, they can shoot me an email. If I can answer it in five minutes, I'll send it right back. If you want me to do a research project, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to charge you for that. But other than that, uh, I'm, I'm just having fun uh, looking at the technology of money over time and uh, it's exciting days and where it's all headed these days, so. I'm trying to, as I talk about in, in this talk, I'm trying to take everything that's gone in the past. What can we learn from that as we go forward? What can crypto learn from what has happened in the past? Because a lot of things repeat themselves, not in the exact same way, but the same ideas come up, same problems come up and just look, how did they deal with this in the past? How can we take a private currency and make it popular, a nationwide currency, you know, yeah. things like this. So uh, I'm excited. It, it's an exciting time. Okay, Dr. Franklin, no, we appreciate the time you've given us. Um, I found this to be a very, very uh, interesting talk and uh, I hope we can do this again sometime. That sounds great. And thanks for letting me talk for so long. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was Franklin Knoll, president of Knoll Historical Consulting. For more of his insights on the banknote history and design and future currencies, 
please visit his website, franklindole.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SB TV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SB TV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.